by Flirtography. They have been remarkably kind, and I, I do think one of the things I think about, I'm so glad when I was cast in 2006, that social media was not so pervasive and toxic as it is today. I think if, if, if social media was like it is today, then uh, maybe the people wouldn't have been so, so kind to me. But I, I realized from the moment I got the part that people are going to say, hey, you're no Mako. And I figured out the best way to counter that is to say, absolutely, I'm not Mako. Mako was nominated for an Academy Award and a Tony Award. Mako's resume spans three decades of good, solid work. I don't, I, I could never be Mako if I tried. You know, I'm not going to be nominated for an Oscar. So once we meet on that, I level the playing field and everybody say, you're right, I agree with you, I'm no Mako. I think everybody was a lot more, you know, cool with me voicing the part. And I, I truly do, you know, I, I have been a fan of his since 1977, when I first heard his voice in a Sondheim musical called Pacific Origins. And, you know, it, it's not an act. I truly do admire this man's work very, very much. And after all that he has given me in my life, it makes me, you know, I, 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 it makes me happy that I can give a little bit back to him by continuing to honor all he did when he was here. And I hope to meet him someday. Just not today. <laughs> you did an amazing job. Man. You're welcome. Thank you. Hello, Uncle Larris. I'm also with JB versus the world. How are you? Hello, my friend. Um, you had mentioned in a panel, I was there earlier today, that you wanted to, uh, things you would like to see if they would expand the Avatar Universe's prequel uh, of sorts about um, Iroh. And I was just wondering, I know you didn't create the character, but I was wondering what your take on that character would be as he was younger and we got to see the general he was before we got to see the benevolent being that he is. I think, I think that would be interesting, you know, because I think Iroh was not always the kind, loving, you know, wise uncle that we know. He was basically a war criminal, you know. He was not a nice guy. And I think it might be jarring for people to see that side of him, but I think it actually might, you know, would appreciate the softer side of him even more. And, and it's literally, it's like that fan said to me, we talked about Iroh's uh, redemption arc. And I, I do believe that the more I think about it, Zuko is Iroh's redemption arc. His redemption arc begins with the death of his son, and it ends when he has molded the new Fire Lord into a good and kind and benevolent Fire Lord, you know? So yeah, I, th I, think, uh, I think that is that is something I definitely would like to see. But I think it would, I think it would be jarring to people, you know? But I think they'd probably get used to it because everybody knows what his past is. So I think people would still be interested in seeing it, not just to take it back by Thank you so much. You're most welcome. Hi, I'm doing very well. Fantastic. I've been playing for a long time. So, out of all the projects you've done, right, you should know so much about the shape. I had a look at you for the TV team, right? You said it's really cool. What has been your best experience? Can you tell me what project was your best experience, right? For you, when we had everything from in past to actually going into the past. I, I would have to say, and I, I would absolutely say that Iroh has been my favorite part. And uh, being part of the Avatar universe has been my absolute. I never expected anything like this. The cast never expected anything like this. When we did the show, we knew it was a good show and it was well written. But if you had told us all oh, 15 years from now they're going to be lining up to meet all of you, we would have said, "What? Well, first of all, that sounds fantastic." And then we would have said, oh, "You're crazy." To be a part, and it's happened to me literally three times within the last two hours. People will come up and. And tell me these stories, and a couple of times it, it almost got me crying as well. And it means that as as an actor or as a storyteller, it means that we've done our job. You know, we made we changed people's lives. We made them laugh or cry, but mostly we made them think. 
and you touch them and, and to be part of something that has genuinely moved people the way Avatar has and specifically the way Uncle Iroh's wisdom has. Because I hear again and again, you know, I didn't get along with my father, Iroh was my father figure. That's, that, that's some, some heavy shoes to step into, but you know what? In, in this world, in this, in this dark world in which we live, any ray of light that we can find is a good ray of light. And if I can, can sort of represent that in the actual world, that is, that's the greatest job in the world, and I'm blessed and lucky to have it. Thank you. I am Kobe Jenkins with the Little Dirty. Hello, my friend. So first, I just wanted to say, uh, when I was a kid, I absolutely adored the, the animated TMNT movie. I still do today. So I like it. It's incredibly like a good crew to talk to. So talking about the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles franchise, um, what, what are your favorite parts about that world and about Master Splinter? Well, I, I would have to say that, that he was voiced by Mako. And I've sort of grown up with the Turtles. I remember I was a little old when they came out. I was probably in my was it the 70s or the 80s when it came out? I think it might have been the 80s, so I remember watching it. It's been interesting to me watching the various alliterations of it, you know, iterations. I think that's the word, not alliteration. That's something altogether different. <laughs> So it's been interesting watching it, and I do agree. Of all of all the teenage music, I, I liked that particular. The CGI was perfect, and you know, I, I I felt a little bit bad at the time because I, they called me up, and it's like, well, I'm kind of. I wrote it just happened, and I guess they knew about this, and they had found a voice actor. And I, I, at the time, I felt, for that matter, I still feel a little bit. Of, I guess you could almost call it stolen valor, you know, because I'm not Mako, but I have been really had a wonderful life and benefited mightily because of Bongo. So at that time, especially when I wasn't, I had barely started voicing Iro, it felt weird to be going in and doing all this dialogue for Splinter, knowing that the man himself was no longer able to do it, you know. And then it, and it also felt weird because he that was his last credited role. And it's like, you know, I, I don't want to really be it felt a little weird. I'm glad that I had the opportunity, but that especially felt a little weird to me at the time. Because he was credited as, as, as you know, Splitter, and I was credited as additional voices. And so it just it felt, as people say, oh, you were Master Splitter. And I was like, I was, uh, I didn't actually voice Splitter because I'm not credited as Splitter, and I don't want to step on Mako's credits. So it's like, I did eh, sort of Splitter. I'm Splitterish. Splitterish, I would say. If I sign anything, I will sign it Greg Baldwin's. Splitterish. Splitterish. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello, Robert from Third Art of Fate. Hello, my friend. So I caught a little bit of your panel uh, uh, earlier. That is correct. I am. I, I got this. I never thought of myself as a tattoo person, you know, because I hate needles. So it's like, I don't think I don't think that's going to be a good fit for me. But I had this idea that I would put the lotus tile and I got just a temporary tattoo and I would wear it at Todd's just as sort of an Easter egg for fans who notice it. Oh, wow. You know, and then the funny thing was that the longer I would wear it at Todd's, I would suddenly not take it off. And the next thing you know, I'm going through five, six tattoos a month. I think it's costing me $50, $60 a month. My wife says, hey, dude, man up. Go down to the tattoo parlor and have it done. And the, they say that once you get one, you want more. From almost the minute that this had healed over, they took the stuff off of it. It's like, oh, what if I put a, a Fire Nation emblem around the White Lotus tile? Or what if I somehow worked Taku from Samurai Jack? And I put, you know, you know, the Jedi insignia. And so, yeah, I'm going mean, to... Time was, I said, does anybody really want to see a 62 year old in the sleeve? Yeah, maybe not, but you know, the beauty of being 62 is I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. So I, I said it in the panel, but it's true. You know, they said, do you really want something that permanent on your body? I'm 62. It's not going to be that permanent. You know, <laughs> literally. I give it 20 years tops, you know, and it, it'll be gone. Not to bring everybody down, you know. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mark from Blurtography. However, I am asking you a question on behalf of our junior reception. First, they would be uh, Jack, but uh, you can have a two-part question, actually. All righty. All right, the first question is, um, so, if, did you want to play a more villainous role in Avatar? And the second part of the question is, do you have a mentally 
I do. I do have one nephew. I have, and I actually mentioned to my wife. I thought, well, isn't it ironic that Uncle Iroh is this famous you know, uncle, and I literally have only one nephew in all the world? And the nicest thing was the nicest thing my wife ever said to me. She said, "Greg, you have millions of nieces and nephews." And it, and it sounds a little weird, but I actually, the more and the longer I live in sort of this Iroh adjacent world, I do start to think of everybody as nieces and nephews. And so it's kind of, honestly, being being almost universally beloved is fantastic. I just want to say that. No one has ever come up to me and go, oh, I hated your character on, you know, on Avatar. And as far as playing a more villainous role in, in Avatar, fortunately, again, thanks to Mako, I was able to play a more villainous version of Iroh, but it was simply named Aku and Samurai Jack. So as I always say, we all aspire to be Uncle Iroh. But every now and then, you just have to have an Aku day! And indeed, if you follow my Twitter, you'll see what I mean. Sometimes I have Aku days. I follow you on Twitter, and you are my best follow. Thank you. Who would you say you know all the time thank you for the Who's your favorite Toto? <laughs> it's Leonardo because you know he's named after Leonardo da Vinci. He's Leonardo. That's why Leonardo. Although I kind of like Michelangelo, to be honest with you. You know. What's your reason why? Uh, mainly I just kind of like the name. <laughs> to, to be honest with you, I think it's kind of a cool name. You know. From the moment I, from the moment I was ten years old, and you know, I, I remember it very, very distinctly. My parents had taken my little brother and I, dropped us off at the movie theater to see a film called Scrooge. It was a musical with Albert Finney, and I don't, I don't think I'd ever seen a musical before. And we got there early, just as the film was ending, and it ends with this giant production number, which is just joy heaped on top of joy heaped on top of joy. Everyone singing and dancing. And I swear, it was all, I was only 10 years old, but it was like a religious experience for me. I, I literally started crying, I didn't even know why. And later I know that I realized I wanted to make everybody else as happy as that movie was making me. And so that's sort of when I discovered musicals. And once I discovered musicals, baby, that was my geeky culture for the longest time. Uh, and even today, I, in the name of, think of musical, I can probably sing a whole song from it. I love musicals since I was, 10 years old, uh, and indeed because it was because of a musical that ultimately I was cast as Uncle Iroh. Because I loved the musical that he was in called Pacific Overtures by Sondheim. And I loved it and I would sing along with the record over and over and over again like you do. And I had no idea at the time that I was actually working on a Mako impression. So, you know, musicals, yeah, I, I am a musical nerd and musicals have changed my life in very, very good ways. Now, my favorite, my favorite episode of Avatar is Tales from Boston, without a doubt, you know, because I like, I've, everybody, it's that seminal moment when he's singing, it's so sad, I like to cry, you know. Now, my favorite musical, that's a, li that's a little trickier because there's musicals from different eras. If, you got, if you're talking golden era, I probably would have to say it would be My Fair Lady. If you're talking about the more the 60s and 70s when Sondheim came onto the scene, it would have to be Pacific Overtures. And then moving forward into the 90s and the, and the big giant musicals, I have to admit I am a fan of Wicked and I'm a, I'm a big fan of Hamilton too. You know, Lin, Lin Manuel. Sondheim is gone, but thank God we have Lin Manuel. You know. Thank you. You're most welcome. Um, just follow up on this question. Uh, since you love musicals, do you love or hate when the bands are actually just singing this song? The song? Yes. It, it surprises me because I've been so vocal about, you know, not singing it. It surprises me when people still ask. And no, actually, it makes, I'm, I'm happy to tell them. It's like, I will, I will not sing the song. Uh, and, and it really is because I, I, I feel like it's not my song. That episode was dedicated to Mako. And that, probably for a lot of people that watch Avatar, that is one of the moments that really is stuck in their memory. And I don't, I don't want to mess with that memory. 
in any way. So not only do I want to thank Mongo and respect him and say thank you for your life and I honor your legacy, I also can't sing it as well. And I don't want people to, you know, think, I don't want to sully anybody's memory. And it, and it does make me think, because I'm lucky I can say I don't want to sing it. But Paul Sun Hyung Lee, who's going to be playing Iro, live action Iro, the Netflix adaptation, is not going to have that option. And I don't see any, there's only way, one way I think they can do it, and none of the fans are going to be bothered by it. Have Mako's actual rendition of the song playing softly in the background. And that way, nobody's going to be upset. Because if he sings it, there are going to be fans that don't like it. If he doesn't sing it, there's going to be a lot of fans that don't like it. So it's kind of a no-win situation. So just let Mako sing his song.